I'd now like to discuss erythroderma or T4 disease. The definition of erythroderma is complete redness of the skin or, or greater than 80% of the skin manifesting redness. Uh, and uh, there can be erythroderma alone without nodal or blood involvement. But more than 80 to 90% of patients who present with erythrodermic cutaneous T cell lymphoma have abnormal circulating malignant T cells in the blood. In other words, they are leukemic. It is certainly an easier chore to treat patients who have pure erythroderma as opposed to erythroderma with leukemia. And the definition of erythroderma with circulating malignant T cells is the Cesare syndrome. Patients who have erythroderma, particularly those with Cesare syndrome, are often treated with photophoresis at our center. Uh, and this is a blood treatment, which I will discuss in a moment. We also use interferons quite frequently, usually together with Targretin or Bexarotene. We sometimes administer PUVA to patients with erythroderma because PUVA, as I mentioned, is effective not only for patients with skin disease, but patients who have circulating malignant T cells as well. Uh, PUVA is difficult to administer for patients who have skin redness, uh, and it should be administered in most cases by a highly skilled phototherapist uh, otherwise, there could be the risk of burning uh, following the administration of PUVA. We also sometimes use total skin electron beam for patients who have erythroderma uh, with or without circulating malignant T cells. Again, in the hands of a highly skilled radiation oncologist, it is a very effective therapy for patients with erythroderma. Uh, uh, Campath. This is an antibody, which I will discuss in a moment, that is also highly effective for Cesare syndrome, but because it has potential immunosuppressive properties, it must be used carefully and under very specific low-dose regimens in an effort to eliminate the cancerous T cells without eliminating healthy T cells from the body. And then for patients who have erythroderma with or without leukemia, we sometimes use HDAC inhibitors, again, varinostat or ramidepsin. We sometimes use chemotherapy. We often uh, have patients enter clinical trials, and we not infrequently have patients undergo an allogeneic bone marrow transplant with, in many cases, quite good success. So shown on this slide is the first generation of photophoresis devices, which was quite an effective device for the treatment of patients with Cesare syndrome. We currently are utilizing a third generation photophoresis device, uh, which needs more significant testing in an effort to determine the relative level of efficacy for the treatment of Cesare syndrome in comparison to the first generation device, but nevertheless, we think it is a very useful therapy for Cesare syndrome, particularly when it's used in combination uh, with uh, adjunctive therapies, including interferon, targretin, and PUVA therapy. Uh, photophoresis is a phoresis therapy which involves separating out the white cells, returning the red cells, and then performing essentially PUVA therapy to the uh, retained white cells that are retained uh, in the sterile device uh, and uh, exposed to the same drug, the 8-methoxysorolin, also known as oxorolin or methoxylin, uh, and then exposed to UVA radiation. And then at the conclusion of the exposure, uh, the cells are returned to the patients. Uh, and then we hope that this serves as sort of a quasi-vaccination 
uh, against the cancerous T cells and hope that the body's immune response will take over and direct killer T cells against the so exposed malignant T cells. So shown on this slide is an example of an electron microscopic uh, photograph of a dying malignant T cell on the right, which is the dark T cell, and an antigen processing macrophage on the left, uh, which is moving in to process the photophoresis treated T cell so that it can help other normal T cells in the body recognize the tumor antigens better so that killer T cells can be harnessed to go after those cancerous T cells wherever they're hiding and to direct an immune response against them. To better direct the immune response against them, we very frequently use interferons, which can help not only the killer T cells, but which can help the processing of the dying photophoresis-treated cancerous T cells. Similarly, bexartine or targretin or other retinoids can be used, which also supports directing the killer T cells after the malignant T cells. Sometimes we use so-called GMCSF, or granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, which helps the processing aspect, or the macrophage to process the dying photophoresis treated T cell so that it can present the tumor antigens to the normal T cells. And we use all of these together with photophoresis and what this can lead to is a 30% complete response rate of our Cesare syndrome patients. So although the textbooks still say that Cesare syndrome is invariably fatal we know that about a third of our patients with Cesare syndrome will develop a complete remission and some patients will never relapse. They will maintain that remission during therapy and after therapy uh, for years and years without ever having a recurrence. So that is the very reason why we take this approach of multimodality therapy to support the immune response and with interferons to stimulate memory T cells in an effort to enhance the duration of the clinical response. Now, an additional nearly 50% of our so treated patients on our multimodality regimen also will have a very significant clinical response, uh, nearing a complete response. And for many of these patients, it is maintained for very long periods of time. So for those who eventually progress, or those who are non-responders, the 20 to 25%, that is when we have to utilize other kinds of therapies. We like to use interferon gamma many, for many reasons. It is a potent alternative therapy to interferon alpha. It's an important therapy in addition to interferon alpha. Uh, so sometimes we use it in combination with interferon alpha. Particularly in the elderly, it can be better tolerated than interferon alpha. And preliminary results suggest that it's at least comparable, if not better, than interferon alpha. So I'd next like to discuss uh, a cream referred to as imiquimod cream. And this is in the same family of medications uh, as reziquimod, which is presently being used in clinical trials uh, for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And this class of drug activates cells in the skin that are referred to as dendritic cells, it is a type of cell that is highly conserved in the immune response that can be activated very, very quickly to make interferon. So when we rub imiquimod cream on the skin, we can directly stimulate dendritic cells to make interferon, which can then recruit killer T cells into the skin 
and activate them and lead to killing of the malignant T cells. Imiquimod can be difficult to use because it comes in small packages and therefore it is difficult to cover large areas of the skin surface. It is also not well absorbed through the skin, so some patients may not respond well to it. Furthermore, it's important to remember for those using amicumod or for those who were eventually prescribed amicumod is that it should not be used with topical corticosteroids at the same time uh, because topical corticosteroids can eliminate those cells in the skin that are the cells that are going to respond to it. So shown on this slide are some of the dendritic cells referred to as PDCs and MDCs. And it is PDCs that react to the amicumod to make interferon alpha, which stimulate NK cells and cytolytic T cells to go ahead and kill the tumor cells. And here is uh, a typical plaque on the skin of one of our patients before micomod treatment, and shown here is that same plaque after treatment with a micomod, uh, with a very potent response to a micomod, showing complete clearing of the plaque. But of course, this patient was very sensitive, and they developed some small erosions in the skin, which sometimes can occur, but these typically heal completely without leaving residual marks in the skin. Uh, many patients will not respond to a micomod, and one reason is because it is not well absorbed in some people. And secondly, if they've been using topical steroids on the skin, uh, they may not be very responsive to a micomod. I'd also, as shown on this next slide, like to put in a plug again for the use of Sorlin plus ultraviolet A also known as PUVA, for treating patients who have not only skin disease, but blood disease. And we have developed scientific evidence that PUVA therapy is effective not only for those with skin disease, but can also help lower the burden of circulating malignant T cells among patients who have leukemia. If your primary treated doctor is an oncologist, you may often hear them say or refer to targeted therapies for cancer. And what that means is targeting the cancerous cells quite directly. You've heard me refer to skin targeted therapy, which means therapies that are directed at the skin. Well, tumor targeted therapy means directed directly at tumor cells. And among this list of skin or tumor targeted therapy shown on this slide is so-called anti-CD52, also known as LMTuzumab or Campath. It's quite an effective therapy for Cesare syndrome. It's an antibody that targets the CD52 protein on the cancerous T cells. And it's quite effective for Cesare syndrome but for a variety of mechanistic reasons, not effective for pure mycosis fungoides without blood involvement. Another treatment referred to as Denilukin diftotox or ONTAC also can target the cancerous T cells by way of their interleukin-2 or T cell growth factor receptors on their surface. So it sticks to their T cell receptor goes into the cell, and ONTAC is a fusion protein which also contains diphtheria toxin. And the diphtheria toxin is released from the interleukin-2, which has stuck to the cell surface, and the diphtheria toxin then kills the malignant T cell. It's an effective treatment for many patients with cutaneous T cell lymphoma. In clinical trial is a so-called anti-CCR4 antibody, which may also be quite effective for Cesare syndrome. And then finally, shown on this slide is something referred to as an AKT inhibitor. So there have been clinical trials with AKT inhibitors. AKT is a particularly important protein 
that plays a role in the regulation of growth of T cells. And in many forms of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, this protein is overexpressed and inhibitors of this protein may be quite effective in slowing the growth of these T cells. With that said, let me make a few comments about LMTuzumab or Campath. Maria Bernengo, whose name is on this slide, has pioneered the low-dose regimen of Campath. And why is that important? We know that in higher doses, such as 30 milligrams three times a week, Campath can be quite effective for what's referred to as B-cell chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's very effective at eliminating the leukemic cells from the blood. It's also quite effective for eliminating normal T cells and can lead to a high degree of susceptibility to infection. So what Dr. Benengo has pioneered is the development of a low-dose regimen, 10 milligrams three times a week, which is very effective at eliminating the cancerous T cells in the cesary form of cutaneous T cell lymphoma without rendering the patients highly immunosuppressed. So many of us will use this therapy for cesary syndrome that has not been responsive to immune modulatory therapies. On the next slide is shown varinostat and romidepsin. These are histone deacetylase inhibitors that can slow the growth and kill the cancerous T cells. Varinostat is uh, formulated in a capsule and romidepsin is formulated as an intravenous uh, formulation for administration by vein. Varinostat, in the pivotal clinical trials that led to FDA approval, uh, was used in highly refractory or highly resistant cases of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, leading to about a 30% response rate, uh, including a very high response rate of severe refractory itching. And for this reason, the FDA elected to approve it. Duration of responses are quite mixed. In the majority of cases, they are quite limited. It is also fraught with the problem of serious side effects, which include very disturbing high frequency of diarrhea, nausea, and also reduction in so-called platelets or thrombocytopenia. So its use can be, limited by the, uh, can be limited by these adverse effects. Shown on this slide is uh, ramidepsin, which was also used in a pivotal clinical trial and received FDA approval based upon approximately a 40% response rate for patients with highly refractory forms of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, but with very durable responses uh, sometimes exceeding 20 months uh, with clearing of skin lesions from patients with advanced forms of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, similarly with clearing of blood disease and nodal disease in patients with advanced forms of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Limiting the use of ramidepsin uh, is uh, the manifestation of some serious side effects including, including serious to control nausea at times, uh, diarrhea and fatigue. Otherwise, it is generally a well-tolerated agent uh, which is easy to administer intravenously, but should be administered under the guidance of someone who's highly skilled in its use. Shown on this slide is the ability to clear the blood. You'll appreciate the graph going down which signifies the clearing of the peripheral blood of malignant T cells in patients with Cesare syndrome during therapy with ramidepsin. Shown on this slide are uh, responses to allogeneic transplant at the University of Pennsylvania, and our experience so far has been quite good for patients with Cesare syndrome who have not had large tumors or bulky lymph nodes, these patients can be excellent candidates for allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. 
Uh, and up until now, approximately half of our patients who have failed to respond to uh, earlier attempts to use immune modulatory therapies are in complete remission long after receiving bone marrow transplantation. However, it is still fraught with the risk of serious graft-versus-host disease, which means attack of the graft cells, the donated transplant cells, on the recipient's own skin, blood, and solid organs, leading to inflammation. This can often be controlled with medications and other treatments, but sometimes can be quite troublesome and difficult to control. We have also effectively used a new agent referred to as brentuximab vidotin. Shown here is a title slide from a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, which summarized the, a uh, critical protocol for the treatment of so-called CD30 positive disorders, including anaplastic large cell lymphoma and resistant Hodgkin's disease, both of which have received FDA approval for treatment with brentuximab. And what this treatment is, it's an antibody that recognizes CD30 expressed on the cell surface of cancerous T cells. And in some cases of mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome, CD30 will be expressed on the surface of the T cells and can signify more rapid growth of those T cells. And brentuximab can occasionally be used for such patients. And it's an antibody that binds to CD30 and then it is internalized within the cancer cell, releasing a toxin referred to as MMAE or monomethyl orostatin that then is released, which kills the malignant T cells. One of the side effects of this treatment is that the toxin can also produce some damage to peripheral nerves leading to numbness and tingling in the hands and feet and lack of sensation in the hands and feet. In most cases, this is reversible upon discontinuation of the medication. And presently, clinical trials are underway using brentuximab vidotin to treat CD30-positive mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome. We also are developing new treatments for itching or pruritus. And our scientific group has recently published our results demonstrating that one of the important factors in the production of itch in cutaneous T cell lymphoma is a molecule referred to as interleukin-31. We have been able to see under specialized microscopes the production of interleukin-31 by the cancerous T cells of patients with cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And when itching resolves after therapy, we no longer seeing it being made by the cancerous T cells. Moreover, we can see elevated levels in the blood of interleukin-31 in our patients who itch, but we do not make this observation in our non-itchy patients. A molecule is being developed by a pharmaceutical company which will inhibit the effects of interleukin-31 to cause itch, and it is soon to be used in clinical trials for our very itchy patients. We also make use of chemotherapy, both single drug and multi-drug, for our patients who fail to respond to immune modulatory therapies and to HDAC inhibitors. Sometimes we make use of single drug chemotherapy because it's often easier to tolerate. And Gemzar and Doxel and Methotrexate can still produce high response rates. Multidrug chemotherapy is often used for aggressive disease, to decrease disease burden, and also used as a segue or as a pathway in preparation for allogeneic transplantation. 
So our general approach, as I've laid out for you, is whenever possible, use immune modulatory therapies, interferons, uh, amiquimod, uh, vitamin A compounds, photophoresis, and whenever feasible to use multimodality approaches, which signifies one or more skin-directed approaches or a skin-directed approach with a systemic approach, an interferon with a vitamin A compound such as bexarotene or targretin, and to target the skin and the blood as necessary simultaneously. And because patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphomas are more susceptible to bacterial infections of the skin to treat infections when they occur, particularly infections with Staph aureus, uh, which occur more frequently in patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Also, quite importantly, we educate our patients to try to remain as positive as possible with their condition. On the positive note, most of you will do extremely well under the guidance of an expert in the field uh, with substantial expertise in the treatment of cutaneous lymphomas. We recommend remaining positive and upbeat, and it's our philosophy that this will help you get through therapy uh, and help you maintain and obtain the best possible response. We also highly recommend practicing healthy living, which signifies practicing a healthy diet, uh, which means elimination of a diet that's high in saturated fat, because a diet high in saturated fat can compromise the normal immune response. We recommend eating lots of fruits and vegetables, particularly green cruciferous vegetables, and mushrooms. We recommend eating a diet that's high in berries that contain high levels of antioxidants. And we recommend uh, avoiding a diet that's high in processed carbohydrates, cakes, baked goods, white bread, white pasta, uh, and uh, unrefined carbohydrates. Uh, we also recommend working with an expert in the field of cutaneous lymphoma whenever possible, uh, since an expert in the field has had uh, the most significant experience in treating the larger number of patients with a variety of conditions and with agents that are in clinical trial and recently tested in clinical trial that are now nearing and have uh, gained FDA approval.